Okay, good Shabbos, everybody. So hopefully all of you were able to read the parasha this week. Parasha is called Teruma, and it's all about the instructions to build the tabernacle this week. And we're going to be spending quite a bit of time studying the building of the tabernacle. Every year we spend a lot of time uh, on the tabernacle. It's one of the most important things that was spoken about in, uh, in the Torah. We're going to spend five weeks studying the tabernacle, the ins and outs, the materials, and all these things. And I remind you that Rome wasn't built in a day, and neither was the tabernacle. So that's why we're going to spend so much time. Now, this week with Parashat Teruma, we start looking at the instructions on how to build the tabernacle, right? Uh, God speaking to Moses, he takes him up on the mountain, and he actually takes him to heaven and shows him the tabernacle. Some say God showed Moses a PowerPoint to show you how to build the tabernacle, a slideshow. And uh, next week, we're going to carry on with the clothing of what happens with the piece of the tabernacle. And then everything gets repeated again, as if when Moses was writing the Torah, he said, control C, control V, copy and paste again by accident. And we're going to read through the exact same stuff again. So it's going to be five weeks of studying all the minutia of the tabernacle and how it was built. Later on, it's repeated because then we actually do what we're told in this week's parasha. Now, the idea of the tabernacle, of God dwelling among us is a very interesting idea. We actually were able to have God as a neighbor. Imagine having God as a literal neighbor. You could say, today I wanna to go visit God and you can go to an actual building and this is known as the dwelling place of God. I don't think we understand this concept fully today because we are so far gone from the generation where they actually had a tablet. Well, the atheists would have said, it goes the neighborhood, as soon as God moved in, but God actually lived in the neighborhood. You could wake up and you could say, today I'm going to go visit the creator of the heavens and the earth. That is a mind-blowing concept. And now we've got to think about how we view God's dwelling in this world. Of course, we know that in the Garden of Eden, God was dwelling in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. His presence, his dwelling presence, which we call the... The what? Shekhinah. Good stuff. You passed the test. <laughs> Let's see how you pronounce it. The Shekhinah, God's dwelling Presence. Chocolate for him, yes. <laughs> Which is probably a Shekinah chocolate. But anyway, they name everything of them nowadays. Um, so in the Garden of Eden, we had God's dwelling presence within us. But the Midrash tells us an interesting story. The Midrash tells us that when Adam and Eve sinned, God had to remove his dwelling presence at least one seventh of the way back to where he comes from, if I can put it that way. The Midrash tells us that there are these seven heavens, right? It's not just a TV show. There are seven heavens. And what God did was at that point, he had to remove his dwelling presence up by one heaven. Then came Cain and killed Abel. Then God had to remove his dwelling presence, another one of those seven heavens. And so came the generation of the flood, etc., etc. Eventually, God had to remove his dwelling presence all the way back to the seventh heaven. But the Midrash tells us that at one point, things turned around. When Abraham came into the picture, Abraham was preaching about the one true God and monotheism. At that point, God decided he's going to come back down to the earth with his dwelling presence. So he came down another one rung, another one heaven towards earth. And then came Isaac, he came down another level. Then came Jacob, came another level. Then came Joseph, came another level. Eventually, by the point we got to Moses in this week's parasha, God decided he's going to reintroduce his dwelling presence presence into this world and that's why we have the instructions in this week's parasha to construct for me a tabernacle a dwelling place so that i may dwell among them so it seems that uh, it doesn't stop there by the way of course later on in history we've got uh, the tabernacle uh, eventually the ark is taken from the tabernacle so god has to remove his dwelling presence again eventually we build the temple so god comes back but then eventually we get, keep on sinning and the temple gets destroyed so god has to remove his presence again so it seems like we keep we keep evicting god from our neighborhood. And then we've got to invite him back. And then he goes and then we invite him back. It's an interesting thing and if you look at what we are doing as human beings. But we learn from this week's parasha how to prepare a place for God's dwelling. And you, it begs the question, and it teaches us a lesson in how to prepare ourselves for the next time God decides to fully bring his dwelling presence back to this earth. Because we're supposed to be looking forward to that towards the third temple. And we can read this week's parasha and understand the preparations that need to take place now so that in future, we can invite God back into the neighborhood. So this week's parasha, if any of you were able to read it, 
It's very time consuming, it's tedious, and it's very technical when you read it. Sometimes it's difficult to read it. If you're an architect, then maybe you enjoy reading stuff like this. But for most of us, we struggle to figure out what an Amos is, what a Tefach is, how much is a cubit. These things, you know, they just make your eyes cross when you try and read them very often. So there's a lot of material that we are supposed to use in building the, the Mishkan, the tabernacle, that is mentioned in this week's parasha. Which doesn't excite everybody, but I can tell you something. How many of you guys have ever been to an Ikea? We don't have it in South Africa. Anyone here been to an Ikea store? Because it's obviously up with Swedish. In Germany, you guys got Ikea as well. I love going to an Ikea store when I'm in Sweden. We can't really compare it to anything we have here in South Africa. It's not the same as a macro. It's not the same as a builder's warehouse, none of these things. It's amazing. It's one of the things I love doing when we're in Sweden. I say, please, let's go to Ikea store just to walk through the store. It's this massive, massive, massive factory store. And in the store, what they've done is they've got fake rooms everywhere. By the time you've walked out of Ikea, you feel like you visited 500 different houses. Because they've got a kitchen set up, or all one corner of the factory is just kitchen rooms. And they've got the cupboards, they've got the dishes, they've got the ovens, and they've got them all over the place. So there's a room, 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 there's kitchens everywhere. Then you move on to the living room section, and you can see all these different buildings and all the different materials, and you can decide how you want your house to look. And then you go up to one of the lovely people that works there at Ikea, and you say, I want that type of house. But I want that kitchen door, and I want that kitchen oven, and I want that table over there. And they go into their computer and they print for you a list of every single item you need to order. And then they give you the list and you go pay for it. And then they ship that order to your house because every single item has got a specific barcode. Imagine if we could have built a tabernacle. This way. It's fantastic. And then you get home and you've got all these pieces and they refer to Ikea as adult Lego. Some of us, if we had Ikea in South Africa, we'd spend our entire weekends just building stuff. It's fantastic. You get your numbers, your codes, and it goes even further than that because you've got these, um, what do you call it? Uh, group funded trading organizations. So you get this app, and if you ever want to decide to change your living room and you decide you want to go for that style of living room, you can go on this app and you can trade your living room pieces with the barcode for someone else's living room pieces with their barcode. So every year you can change your living room for free. It's amazing how they've got this set up there overseas and I, you know i wish one day they would bring it here to our country so we can do it as well but listing all the items just like they do there at ikea the torah does for us this week as well you need all these materials this gym you need gold you need copper you need silver you need these hooks you need wood you need etc etc today i want to talk about one of the items that is mentioned in the parasha the wood the sheeting wood which is translated in english as acacia wood that we use Anyone know what happened to the original acacia wood that was used in the tabernacle? Where it is today? I know that the, in Ethiopia, they claim to have the Ark of the Covenant. Close, very close. In fact, just look up. Do you see these wooden bars here? Tradition says these are the originals. <laughs> the guy that drove the truck that offloaded these bars, his name was Moses. I'll tell you that much. Okay. Truthfully, I know where we got it from. We got it from where? Timber City or uh, uh, Chamberlain's? We got it from Chamberlain's. Okay, we got it from Chamberlain's, right? Maybe we should start charging people as a tourist site. There you go. <laughs> Maybe. But, uh, no, he wasn't. Davi was Jew, was he? No, he wasn't. <laughs> Scottish. So here's the question that's asked by Rashi and many other commentators. When we left Egypt in such a hurry, where did we find all the material to build the Mishkan, to build the tabernacle specifically? Where did we find the material and the wood that was used in the Mishkan? We didn't schlep that out of Egypt. It's heavy. Where did we get it from? Was there a timber city in the desert? Was there a Kia store out there in the desert? No, none of the above. And Rashi tells us this is where we got it from. Rashi says, based on the Midrash, that we have to give thanks to our father Jacob, Yaakov. Because when Yaakov had to come down to Egypt, remember when he found out that Joseph was still alive? Yaakov brought with him these acacia trees. And before he entered into Egypt, he planted these acacia trees just outside of Egypt, remembering the promise that God made to Abraham that one day your descendants will become a slave into another nation. But do not worry, call out to me and I will bring them out from that nation and take them to the promised land. 
He saw this coming, so he planted these trees, he replanted these trees from Beersheba, where he got them, and he brought them over here, and he replanted them there to encourage the generation of uh, the Exodus when they come out, not to assimilate into the world and go back to Egypt, but tell them, hey, this is part of God's plan. Be encouraged. Here's the word, build God a tabernacle. Now, in the Talmud, another rabbi, Rav Yaakov, comes along and takes us even further back. He says, where did those trees that were originally in Beersheba come from in the first place? Abraham, our father, planted the seeds of those trees in the holy city of Beersheba. That's how far back this actually goes. Because Abraham heard the promise from God that this would happen to his descendants. And he said, let me start now preparing a dwelling place for God's presence. Because remember, in Abraham's generation, God decided he's going to come down the very first rung again out of the seven heavens to prepare a place for him to come and dwell on this earth again. So Abraham was the start of all of this. Jacob, his grandson, was putting the branch manager because he was the one that brought the trees down. Okay. So this teaches us a vital lesson in our quest to build a dwelling place for Hashem once again. We don't have to wait until Yeshua returns and says, okay, I'm here to rebuild the temple. We can do something about it even now, even if we are seven heavens away from when that day will actually occur. Building the third temple happens now. It's currently under construction. And how do we do it? Through our good deeds. We should also have that same foresight that Abraham and Jacob had. And we should also plant seeds now in preparation for the Messianic era. I want to remind you of a story we told you many years ago, a story from the Gemara, from the Gemara about a rabbi named Rabbi Chia. Him and another rabbi, I think his name, I think it was also Rabbi Yaakov, uh, were having an argument about what's going to happen to Israel if we ever forget the Torah. Remember, the Romans were in charge and they were planning on destroying Israel and taking away our Torah and our, uh, our teaching of Torah to our children. So they were wondering, what will we do if the entire nation of Israel forgets the Torah? And this other rabbi, Rabbi Yaakov, said, oh, don't worry. If they ever forget the entire Torah, I will single-handedly teach them the entire Torah again. Not to worry, I'll be the Superman, the knight in shining armor. Rebbe Achia says, it's a good plan, but my plan is better. Because yours is waiting for something to happen, whereas my plan, I've already started. Here's how I will ensure that children of Israel never forget the Torah. What I do in my spare time is, I plant flax seed. And then I water that seed, and I watch it grow. And eventually, I harvest the flax. And I use that flax to weave nets. And I take those nets into the forest, and I use those nets to trap and to capture deer for hunting, basically. And then when I catch the deer, I kosher slaughter the deer. The meat I donate to the local orphanage. But the skins of the deer that hide, I turn into parchment, like this tallest call, a hide that you can write on. And what does he do? He takes the five books of Moses, and he writes a different book on every parchment. So one parchment is Genesis, one parchment is Exodus, etc., etc. Then he takes those parchments and he goes to cities around Israel where there are no rabbis teaching the children. And he goes to the children and he hands each of the children one of these different parchments. So this child gets Exodus, this one gets Leviticus, this one gets Deuteronomy. And he tells them it is your religious duty to memorize that entire parchment, that book of the Torah. And his kids memorize it. And he tells the kids, now that you have memorized it, you who learned Genesis, teach all these other kids what it says in Genesis. And then you who learned Deuteronomy, teach all these other kids what it says in Deuteronomy. And then at the end of the day, not only are these kids taught about the Torah, but that city that never had a rabbi in the first place now has at least five rabbis in every city. So he said to this rabbi, you see, I am already ensuring right now that Israel will never forget the Torah. It's a wonderful story. He's a genius of the guy, this guy. He already started planting the seeds at that stage that one day would find fruition when these kids themselves would graduate and become rabbis in their own time. And for us sitting here today as disciples of Yeshua, we too are known for investing in the long term, long term right? We've been speaking about this quite a lot in the last few weeks. We are, every mitzvah that we do, every act of kindness that we perform, it's an investment in the messianic era. It's like we are donating to the building of the third temple already now when we do acts of charity and good deeds. One day, 
the things we do today is going to be the support beam, so to speak, of that third temple, the Mikdash Ashlishli. And Yeshua teaches us this very thing through a set of different parables in the Gospels as well. Because he asks us a few times in the Gospels, especially in the Synoptic Gospels, he says, what, to what can the kingdom of heaven be compared? Let me take you to three parables. For example, Mark chapter 4, verse 26. In Mark 4, verse 26, we find the parable of the sprouting seed. Where Yeshua says the following. He said, the kingdom of God is like a person casting seed in the ground. He went to bed and got up night and day. And the seed sprouted and grew. But he didn't even know about it. For the earth brings forth its fruit by itself. First the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. And when the fruit is mature, he immediately sends up sickle for the harvest is ripe. So what's the meaning of that parable Yeshua teaches us? He's talking about the kingdom. He's saying this is how the kingdom of heaven looks. What's the kingdom referring to? The messianic era that's going to come when we rebuild God's, uh, God's temple and we have a dwelling place for Hashem. So the meaning of the parable is that the kingdom starts small. It's a simple seed that we plant. But over time, the kingdom keeps growing and growing and gets bigger and bigger. This is the kingdom that Yeshua was building. He follows us up with another parable, the parable of the mustard seed. This is what he says with the parable of the mustard seed. He says, to what shall we compare the kingdom of God? And which parable shall we use for it? The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. What, is the, what do we know about mustard seeds? They're tiny. <laughs> Whenever we read a Rabbinic literature and they want to compare something in size, they say, oh, that is like a mustard seed in comparison to that mountain, for example. Mustard seed is the smallest type of seed, right? So he says, the kingdom is like a mustard seed that is sown in soil, which is the smallest of all the seeds that are on earth. After it is sown, it comes up and grows even larger. And then all the other vegetation and produce, uh, it grows larger than all the other vegetation and it produces branches so that large birds, uh, so that large birds of heaven can come and nest in its shade. So once again, the same story, the same parable, giving us the same idea. The kingdom of heaven starts small with a small seed, but it grows larger. And eventually, even the birds of heaven, which uh, there's actually a quote from the book of Daniel talking about Gentile nations, will come and rest in its shade as well. It's teaching the same thing. Messianic era starts small, the kingdom of heaven. Another parable that we find in Matthew, Matthew actually follows us up with another parable, we all know, from Matthew chapter 13, where he says, to what can we compare the kingdom of heaven? We can compare it to yeast, to chomets. Like a woman who was making three se'ah of flour, massive amount of flour, and she added, she actually, it says in that parable, and she hid a little bit of yeast in those three se'ah of flour. And what happens? It eventually spreads and becomes big, like the wonderful chalas that we eat on Friday night that we read about in this week's parasha. So once again, the kingdom grows and grows and grows, but it starts with one simple, small seed. And I think the reason why Yeshua started giving these um, parables to the people was because he was trying to address the people's eschatology, their view of what the Messiah must come do and how the third temple will be built and how the coming of the Messiah will look. Because the people at that stage were expecting this warrior Messiah who would come and destroy Rome in a day. If Rome wasn't built in a day, it's not going to be destroyed in a day, right? This is what they were expecting, this warrior Messiah who would come and defeat Rome. And I think sometimes, even today, we expect the same when we read the Bible, when we read God's promises, and we ask God in our prayers for things. We expect it now, right? I want patience and I want it now. That's what we say to Hashem. We have that same impatience as well, I think. And if you think about it, how many of you have ever heard a Jewish community sing the song, we want the Shiach now, we want the Shiach now. In one sense, it looks a little bit arrogant, it looks a little bit impatient, but it's good. We are supposed to be yearning for the redemption, for the return of God's dwelling. We're supposed to be yearning for it with our full hearts, but there is a different way that we can already now start yearning for that redemption and start building that base of Mikdash even in this day and this age. We should yearn for the redemption to rebuild God's dwelling so that his dwelling presence can come among us. And we can learn a lesson from all three of these stories that I should share. From the Midrash, it tells us it goes all the way back to Abraham and Jacob who brought these trees down on the occasion for the tabernacle. From the story of Rabbi Chia, who planted seeds now so that the Torah would never be forgotten. And from the parables that Yeshua shares about what the kingdom is like, the kingdom starts as a small seed. We can learn that one way that we can ensure God's dwelling will be here soon 
is by planting seeds now that will one day be brought to fruition as a dwelling place for God so that his presence can come dwell among us again. Because we as a people need to be pure in order for God to come and dwell among us. So there's things we need to do to ourselves. That's the whole point of the tabernacle actually, to purify us so that we can approach God. So we need to do these things now already. We need to plant seeds through our acts of tzedakah, our charity that we show towards people around us. That's part of this parasha, right? The parasha starts off by saying, you shall take for me a donation from among the people of Israel. So we can donate already now towards the building of the third temple, not just in monetary value, but through our actions, through our deeds, through the things we do. Because the way that they were donating towards the tabernacle in the sixth parasha, it says, those whose hearts make them want to donate. So we need to check our hearts, work on our hearts right now. We need to do acts of chesed, acts of loving kindness to those around us. And above all else, Yeshua says to us, what is the greatest commandment? We shall love God. But the second is equal unto it. So 1.2 in the list is love your neighbor as yourself. Can you imagine living in a neighborhood where people actually love their neighbor the way Yeshua taught us? We wouldn't need any of these walls we've got up here. This is a utopia we're talking about. Can you imagine living a life of comfort and happiness in a place like that? This paradise that we're all dreaming about when we, we talk about one day immigrating to wherever we go nowadays, New Zealand, Australia, England. And you get there and you realize it's much better off here in the first place than it is over there. Imagine living in a neighborhood like that. When we can truly show love the way that Yeshua showed love for his neighbor, when we can show that love to our neighbor, then we've created a neighborhood, a dwelling place, where God's dwelling presence would be welcome. He would finally move back into our neighborhood. So I encourage you all, let's plant seeds today already. And one day, our very names will be written on the walls of the third temple when Messiah comes to rebuild. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom.